Hey, Natalie. Hey, Sarah. You know what I miss? What do you miss? I miss gabbing with you about Greenwood. I miss it too. But did you know that we're coming back with new episodes soon? (gasps) We are? We are. But first, we have some older episodes to air. So stay tuned for new episodes with Greenwood Gab with Sarah and I. Yay! We're gabbing with Greenwood. Greenwood Gab. Welcome back to Greenwood Gab. All right. So here we are talking about Southside Rates for the month of November. Yes. Animal stories. We're excited. We have Emily Kane here with us, one of the founders with the idea for Southside Reads. And she's going to talk to us about that and her participation in the challenge and what she read this month. Let's get into our interview with Emily. We are joined by a very special guest. Emily Kane is here with us, a member of our Southside Reads reading group, to talk with us a little bit about Southside Reads and her history with it. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Emily, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do here at Longwood, and a fun fact about yourself. Well, it's great to be here. I'm Emily Kane. I'm Director of Study Abroad and Associate Director of the Center for Global Engagement and also Co-Coordinator of the International Studies Minor. That means that I help students and faculty make study abroad programs happen, find the ones that work best for students, whether it's programs with faculty or with our partners all around the world. I also teach every so often. I am most Mostly now teaching international studies. I split those duties with Dr. Isabel Fay in communication studies. I've been here seven and a half years, which is wild <laughs> and wonderful in lots of ways. It's been great to be back in Virginia. I'm a native Virginian, although from up north in Manassas, and I lived out of state for 10 years before I came back to Virginia. So it's been really nice to be back in the Commonwealth and especially to be involved in something so community oriented like Southside Reads. So thanks for having me with that. And your fun fact. My fun fact. Let's see. I'll go with, I got to meet the Dalai Lama when I was in college at, at UVA. And I was so ridiculously excited that after I shook his hand outside of Cabell Hall on the lawn, I went to the end of the line and shook it again. (laughs) 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 And he looked at me like, uh, didn't we already do this? And I looked at him back like, yes, but I need some more peace and understanding in my life. A uh, fun and embarrassing little fact about myself. <laughs> That's very cool. I thought you might have gone with something travel since you're the director of study abroad. But oh, it's nice that your fun fact happened here in well, Virginia. Th- that was before my travels abroad really happened in earnest. So that would have been my third year, I think, at UVA or maybe my fourth year. And I really didn't get to go abroad very much until after college. I did a big backpacking trip. And then in graduate schools, when I really got into study abroad through a program at the University of Georgia in Oxford. So I always tell the students, I really understand what it's like to be nervous about making it happen and thinking that you can't make it happen because I talked myself out of it as an undergrad. And I'm just lucky that I push myself to make it happen later. We wanted to start by asking you a little bit about your role in getting Southside Reads off the ground. So you want to talk a little bit about the early days of Southside Reads? Sure. So it started as just a conversation with a friend with Joellen Peterson. She has a friend who's a librarian that she knew from, I think, graduate school who had, who had they have a challenge in Wichita. And we looked at it and we're pretty excited about it. Joellen had done it every year. And so we, a bunch of friends got together and sort of made our own version of it where you, instead of picking specific books, you pick themes. And that way, it's a little bit more accessible for folks to be involved and less intimidating as far as today's book is Ulysses, you know. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, I'd love to do that, of course, because I'm a nerd. But it is nice to be able to have a little bit more freedom in in what you're going to read. And there's less... I would say prejudice about like different genres and things. You know, I've pushed myself to get outside of what I normally am attracted to reading wise. Although you'll definitely see some patterns when I talk about the books that I read. <laughs> um, but it is nice to, I really enjoyed in talking with Joellen back a few years ago about 
getting into reading, pushing myself to read more because I had been in a real rut where there was a year where I looked back and I think I only read two books. Mm, wow. I have a PhD in English. That is embarrassing. <laughs> so, and I was reading lots of articles and tweets, but that doesn't really count. <laughs> So we did it sort of as a friend group and then thought it would be cool to have, you know, for Longwood to do something like that. And so it was really exciting to get to talk to y'all and hear library staff really just know how to do it, know how to make it happen, know how to reach out to the community, know how to find themes that were that were going to be good for the, the, the people in the Southside community. And it's been really exciting. Of course, when we got started, it was a challenge because... <laughs> just a little global pandemic, <laughs> making it hard to do the uh, meeting in person stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the first meet in person I did was the one at the Moton, maybe, mm -hmm. which was really good. But that that was hard to get it started during that. So it's been really nice to be able to, you know, get together at Waldi's or Starbucks or what was the, the brewery, of course, mm -hmm. just thinking of all the Great places in Farmville that have popped up too to to help make it happen. So it's just really been a delight. And I gotta say, it's like one of the things I really love about working on a campus is that you're not you can be isolated in your area if you choose to stay there, right? And I definitely don't. The nature of my job is to like get out and go see how people learn all over the place and and try to help people where I am based explore the same sorts of things. So I try to do that in practice at my institution too. get to know people in the library or go to Blackwell Talks, which I see you all at all the time too. <laughs> so I'm very glad for that. You know, go to things like Symposium Day and Research Day and be involved with the QEP. And I'm not on the committee. I just go to the sessions. But it's important to me to see how Longwood works mm -hmm. and, and to understand what's going on in other places because that helps me to relate better to students who are trying to make tough things happen. So it's been a joy to be a part of it and to also push myself in ways that are adjacent to, but not central to my work in, in the CGE. So I've, I've really loved it. And also it's making me, not making me, it's encouraging me because it's a friendly group, right? <laughs> Nobody's mad at each other, which is great to read things that I've had on the shelves for a while that I say, Oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I've actually ticked some of those off, which is great, including what were, what I read for this month and then a couple of other ones that I remember some of my favorites. So I love that. I love that it's a little bit more accessible. And, you know, as we're coming out of or adapting to COVID more, it's been nice to see how, how y'all have built on the very baby seats <laughs> <laughs> that were there in the beginning. And that's really just been a pleasure to, to be involved and to make sure that I'm still reading because it is such a relief and such an important thing to keep learning which this helps me do, whether I'm reading the book that I did for this month, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat by Hal Herzog, mm -hmm. or uh, Murders on the Iditarod Trail, as I did last month for by Sue Henry. Well, very different kinds of books, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said, you know, originally this was kind of out of your purview, but I think, you know, study abroad books are escapism, too. Oh, for sure. So you can travel through books if you can't travel, but students at Longwood should do study abroad. <laughs> Talk to Emily. Um, so you mentioned some of the books that you just read, but mm -hmm. what were some of your favorite themes that we've done so far? Yeah, so interestingly enough, they've kind of been things that are a little bit outside the norm for me. So when it's like classic novels, I'm like, yes, now I can, you know, read that embarrassing hole in my canon, right? <laughs> and those are really good. But last month's I really liked, it was the thrilling reads. I like that kind of entertainment in like TV and movies. And interestingly enough, in audiobooks, like I used to, when I used to do the long drive between where I used to live in New York and Virginia or where I used to live in Georgia and Virginia, the way I stayed awake on long drives was to listen to murder mysteries. But I never really sat down to read them. It was always just, oh, that's a thing that helps me stay awake in a car because mm -hmm. it's engaging my my brain and the whodunit. So making myself sit down and read, and I mean like a pretty pulpy, you know, <laughs> blood on the cover murder novel. <laughs> Not actual blood, just, you know, a picture of <laughs> blood on the Iditarod Trail it was really awesome. I had gone on the Brock experience back in June as a sort of logistics support 
And we went to a bookstore in Fairbanks. I love to go to bookstores and and the different places I get to visit. This one was called Forget Me Not Books, and it was used, and they were having a half-off sale, which means they were especially cheap books that day. (laughs) So I got a couple of, you know, nice books about Alaska, which is important. And then I sort of jokingly with my colleagues was saying, oh, look at this. I'm going to get something crazy about Alaska. And there was this blue book with a faded cover that had like raised print on it. And it says murders on the Iditarod Trail by Sue Henry. Never heard of Sue Henry, but I did get to see where the Iditarod Trail began when we were in Anchorage. And I bought it and then let it sit for a while. So It wasn't until October for for thrilling reads that I finally was like, okay, let's do this. And it did take me a bit, but it was really enjoyable and silly and smart and well-researched having now been to Alaska. I mean, I didn't go out to Nome. Let's be serious here. And I am not a dog musher. (laughs) (laughs) But it was really cool to sort of see that come to life and have murder mixed in with it like many middle-aged women. I'm super into true crime podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) So... So doing that in reading and not just in hearing or in watching TV was really cool. And it makes you think more about how writers sort of conjure up these worlds and what they're sort of getting at when they're telling these stories. So I loved being pushed to do the thrilling reads category and haven't read something like that in quite a while since like, you know, teen days of like R.L. Stein, right? <laughs> Or even, you know, let's face it, Teen was probably the Interview with the Vampire and Rice yeah. series, and then younger than that, R.L. Stein and stuff like that. Book to screen is something I always like to do because in my literary studies, I was always really interested in like editorial theory and revision theory. So when you look at texts and you see how they change over different iterations, how that changes overall meaning or if it does, or sort of the historiography of the text itself. And when any text becomes a TV show or a movie, there's big debates about how successfully (laughs) or not that has happened. And sometimes that it's more successful to sort of let go of the original text. I know we've had lots of good conversations. Unfortunately, delays from COVID have meant that (laughs) the book that I read, Leave the World Behind by Rahman Alam, it hasn't come out yet, but it was a really good book. So I've read a lot of the world is ending, maybe kinds of books in the last few years. (laughs) I do tend to lean into disaster in that, you know, during the pandemic, I read that. I read American War by Omar el which is about (laughs) the after effects of climate change in a second American civil war. So in the future, right? Or is it? (laughs) Um, So those and like during the pandemic, I watched the entire run of plane disaster or air disasters. Um (laughs) Which, why? And I guess it's like when you come out the other side, you're like, oh, well, but that show, it's, well, I've learned something that has gotten better in aviation. Mm-hmm. So now I feel more confident about flying. These books, though, they're projecting the future. So I can't say that that's not going to happen, right? And when we look back at books like that, like 1984, Brave New World, some of it, you're like, yeah, that didn't happen. And other things, yeah. like... uh Margaret Atwood, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, oh God, <laughs> is it happening? So maybe it's, it's preparation in some ways, but I, I do like, I, I do like to do the debates about book to screen to see how, you know, how that vision is true or not true to the original writer and what kinds of interpretations the filmmakers have on it. I remember like one of the worst ever, I think you all can fight me. That's fine. <laughs> was the the most recent Great Gatsby, which I love Baz Luhrmann, but it was not good. And I just like almost, (laughs) this is not the spirit of the book at all. Certainly like the grandiose Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, it's a gift now, like with the, with the, I'm, you guys can't see me because this is a, <laughs> this is an audio medium, but I'm cheersing a glass yeah. right up my, uh, friendly neighborhood librarians in front of me. <laughs> but yeah, so I like to do those sorts of debates too and to sort of see what other people think and also have people remind me that, you know, books are precious and wonderful and texts are really important, but they're also books and texts, right? And it's okay to say, I have a different interpretation and this is how I envision it. I think we have to open ourselves up to that. Nothing is, well, 
This is going to be big debates, but it doesn't have to be a sacred cow, right? It can be inspiration that helps us view something different. So I really, yeah, so that's one category that's pretty familiar to me. And then another that really pushed me outside the American war one actually came from, uh, I think it was environmental issues or something like that was the, was the category, which I like to, or climate fiction, which was cool to get outside of my norm. Cause you know, that's not really where I normally go, even though <laughs> everything I'm telling you right now sort of sounds like it. <laughs> everything is taking a turn. Well, that's the point of Southside Reads. Yeah. To get you out of your, your comfort zone. Yeah. And even if you find some kind of niche within that, that's. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes it can be freeing to kind of lean into the disaster when yeah. it's happening. Cause at least in a story, there is some sort of conclusion, even yes. if in real life, there has yet to be one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We laugh nervously. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the clues captioning was. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nervously. Ominous music. <laughs> Melancholy music. <laughs> I, well, thank you for telling me how I'm supposed to feel about this music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just like two notes and it's like ominous music. I'm like, okay, so I guess. I guess Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you mentioned uh, very briefly the book you read for this month. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, what you read for animal stories? Yeah, so I went nonfiction this month. So the stories are academically researched, (laughs) right, (laughs) by Hal Herzog, who, as of the writing of the book, was at Western Carolina, one of the world's leading anthrozoologists, which if you don't know what that is, he tells you pretty soon in there. Basically, he studies the human-animal relationships. And so the book is called Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, and subtitled Why It's So Hard to Think Straight About Animals. And the book cover, which I think is kind of delightful, so the some we love is on a puppy, mm-hmm. the some we hate is on a mouse, and some we eat is on a pig. Mm-hmm. So it's a really wide-ranging, entertaining look at human-animal relationships why we keep some animals as pets in the U.S., whereas in other countries they might serve those ones as dinner, right? And when you think about that, it sounds horrifying. But the way that Herzog approaches it, he does this sort of sociological and psychological analysis of the origins of these relationships and how they came to pass. makes you understand the differences that much better. So I really appreciate that. I I got to go before COVID on a site visit to our partners, the School for Field Studies in Kenya. So that was the last out-of-country trip I got to do back in winter of 2019. And one of the courses on that is called The Human Side of Conservation. And so it talks about, the program itself is about natural resource management, animal or wildlife management. And it talks a lot, they talk a lot about elephants because elephants are literally and figuratively a big deal in (laughs) in Kenya. And you hear like one of the things they work to dispel is our on that program is our sort of preconceptions and the way we might judge other cultures for behaving in particular ways. And one of them is that, you know, they're they have a problem with Kenyans killing elephants, right? And when you think about that from this sort of very cozy, like middle class middle-aged white woman in in Virginia kind of perspective. It is, how dare they? Like, how, why would they do that to Dumbo, right? But it's not that easy. And when you're, when you're on the ground, you learn a lot more about it, that these animals who are beautiful and wonderful and interesting and really funny, if they stomp on your garden and that is how you eat, that is a problem, right? Mm-hmm. If the wildlife is not being managed in such a way that the animals are coming through and destroying gardens and thus food supplies or crushing fences and then making it easier for other animals that can't walk over a fence like an elephant can to walk in. That's a real problem. Mm -hmm. So getting to learn more about that, I'm not saying go shoot elephants, of course. (laughs) I'm saying you can't just say to fix the problem, you can't just tell people, hey, don't shoot elephants. Um, You have to understand what what the problem is and why. And the book reminded me a lot about what I learned on that trip why it's really important to think a little bit more critically, not just about what other people do, but what I do myself. So it just, it was a really good book for me to think critically about why I make the decisions that I do. And 
you know, to give a little bit more grace to people who make different ones. It's a book I've been wanting to read for a while. A friend of mine who works at Eastern Kentucky University, they had it as their freshman read a few years back. So she gave it to me. But yeah, that's what I've really loved about this challenge in particular is getting me to read things that are easy to leave on the shelves, which I had a real problem with. (laughs) <laughs> so I just go buy new things. Yeah. Yeah. Natalie, you know. Yeah. We yeah. were up in Virginia few, or up in Northern Virginia a few weeks ago. And I'm in a used bookstore at McKay's used books. Big plug, Richard McKay books, the happiest place on earth. <laughs> this huge used bookstore with books, you know, CDs, DVDs, comic books, you name it, they got it. And it's glorious. And I still have like twenty dollars worth of credit. So I'm super pumped about that. <laughs> but um yeah, I can't go there and not buy things, even when I know I'm supposed to be culling from my collection. <laughs> and I have this wonderful library where I can get the books anyway, but I, well, I don't stop myself from that. <laughs> yeah, as a librarian who works in this wonderful library, we ran into each other at my Kay's <laughs> used books up in Northern Virginia randomly. It was hilarious. Um, so it was funny. We can't, even we have time off, we're both nerding out, grabbing yeah. more stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could probably talk forever. Absolutely. Um, I think it was the very first episode, maybe, of the podcast that we talked about friends that we play music trivia with. Yes. And that maybe one day we would prove to you that we had friends by having them on the podcast. And Emily is one of those friends. (laughs) First a competitor, now a collaborator. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's glorious. Yeah. Uh, so do we want to kind of wrap up with the fact that you tried to show Joellen up and you also brought us a gift? I did. And in fact, I brought you the world. So <laughs> I've got the whole world in my hands. I would say literally, I mean, the gift is literally in her hands. Just, <laughs> just but a representation of our, our dear blue planet. But yes, that's those are um, stress balls slash things that you can throw at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're giving blood, it's it could be a good oh, pump for giving oh, blood. Yeah. yeah. But there are little worlds from the from the international studies minor, which I encourage any students to think about a nice interdisciplinary d- minor to add to any major. Reach out to Emily Kane or Isabel Fay. <laughs> or just email international studies at longwood.edu. But yes, happy to share gifts and happy to come on and talk to you all about this great challenge, which is again so nice and accessible. It is not overbearing or, I mean, it can be competitive. <laughs> Sometimes people read things and I'm like, I don't th- I think I'd like that. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way. And it is a nice thing to add. Even students can, can access it because there's no length requirement. There's yeah. no specific book requirement. You can make an argument for how, why pretty much anything is in a particular category, which is nice. And sometimes those kinds of debates are are really nice to to take part in. And it's really cool to sort of see common themes come up, even if the books are very different, right? Mm -hmm. Like certainly in something like Book to Screen, or we had the writer, the author debut category. It was really neat to sort of see how you can sometimes tell or what are the the common threads in Mm -hmm. in a debut if you're trying to get it all out the first time in case you don't get to do another one yeah <laughs> maybe we do a sophomore one next time and we'll talk about like all right they they had some stuff left or they didn't yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh goodness well thanks y'all for having me yeah thanks for taking that idea and making it a reality it's really cool to see it in action Thank you for uh, germinating the idea <laughs> <laughs> so that we could cultivate it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Great conversation with Emily Kane. Glad to have her be a part of Southside Reads. Yeah, and we love when people come on and tell us how great we are so it's true so if you want to do that let us know we'd be happy to have you on the show yes well now why don't we uh talk a little bit about the books we read for this month okay do you want to start or do you want me to start i'll start okay so i read blanca and roja by anna marie macklemore i kind of maybe cheated but maybe not with the animal stories theme, because my book is fantasy. It's actually a retelling of Snow White and Rose Red with this kind of family curse in which every family or every generation of this family has two daughters, 
And on, I believe, their 15th birthday, one of them is cursed to turn into a swan. So Mm -hmm. these are kind of people who turn into animals, maybe. So we're kind of leading up to one of the sisters turning into a swan. And the whole issue is they never know like which one it's going to be. So their whole lives, they've kind of had this rivalry because they don't know like who's going to leave the family by turning into a swan. And I don't want to give too much away. (laughs) So I don't know. There are two other, of course, that's this is a YA novel. So there are two boys to kind of go along with the two sisters. And they also turn into animals. So they go into the woods and one of them turns into a bear and then turns back. So they've got that going on. (laughs) (laughs) It was really good. I recommend it. I just don't, I I don't know like what's a spoiler and I don't want to give too much away. Okay. So I kind of went into it blind. Emily kind of talked about how, you know, she's had books sitting on her shelf and she hasn't read them. So that's kind of what this one was for me. I used to be part of a YA like book subscription box. And this book actually came in the, I believe it was 2018, one of the 2018 monthly boxes. So I've had this since and I hadn't read it. So I figured it'd be good for animal stories. And it helped me to get a book off of my TBR pile. Well, there you go. So what did you read? (laughs) Well, so I had originally intended to read Life of Pi by Jan Martel. That was the book I had chosen for this month. But as the month is very close to ending and as our book discussion is tomorrow, I have not started it yet and do not believe I will be able to read it (laughs) in the time I have left. But I happen to be reading another book this month that fits the theme, at least, you know, it's not 100% an animal story, but there is sort of a mythical horse that shows up right at the very beginning of the story. So I thought that it works. As Emily mentioned, you can be kind of creative with the books you choose. So I'm reading Winter's Tale by Mark Helprin. And the reason that I picked this book to read just in general in the first place is because I had this idea to read books that were published the year I was born. So it was published in 1983. And it's a literary magical realism novel, but it starts with this kind of point of view of a white horse that has escaped from his master stables and is running through the streets of New York City and happens to come across this character, Peter Lake, who is getting ready to be killed by a street gang that is after him. And the horse comes in and rescues Peter Lake, and they ride off together. And as Peter Lake is riding this horse, he discovers that this is not an ordinary horse. This horse can jump like two or three city blocks at a time, almost like it's flying. It seems like preternaturally intelligent. It's more than just a regular horse. And he does have a conversation with a a character where he discovers that the horse is actually a mythical horse named Athansor, which is sort of a guardian angel-like character that's able to fly and possesses extraordinary endurance. So it's sort of like an angel that comes in to rescue Peter Lake, but also shows that Peter Lake has this connection to this other world. So I won't give away too much of the book, but it is told in sections and you get the story of Peter Lake and this young woman named Beverly Penn, who he falls in love with. And that's kind of the first section of the book. And the second section, you meet some new characters. And as you read, you kind of understand how all of these stories kind of tie together through this sort of love story with New York and the magical mythicalness of it all, as well as the practicalness of just life in late 19th, early 20th century New York. I don't know if that really tells you much, but well, I mean, I didn't really say anything about my book either. (laughs) I will say I did like the writing of my book. Each chapter switches perspectives. So you don't just get like one character telling the story, all four. So the two sisters and then the two boys give their perspective on what's happening. So that's fun about this novel. I think that might be it for us for this episode. All right. Well, I mean, I think we had quite a a good conversation with Emily. So I think we have enough to get us through an episode. (laughs) 
Yeah, we we probably could have talked forever. And we are called Greenwood Gab, and the gift of Gab means that you can go on and on, but we'll just say have a great. Have a great. It's another episode of of our Southside Reads Greenwood Gab Extravaganza Time. (laughs) It's the acronym for that. Or should we start with Greenwood Gab? G G S R E T. Greenwood Gab Southside Reads Extravaganza Time. Gugusarit. There you that go. That doesn't work. Hey Sarah, it's time for Gugusarit. <laughs> <laughs>